The CIOs are mad as hell, and they're not going to take it anymore. Cloud costs are too high. Let's talk about it. Well, welcome back to the Cloud Computing Insider, uh, where we talk about the realities of cloud computing and how to make it work for your enterprise. I'm your host, author, speaker, b geek, Dave Linthicum. Let's get going. So this is a topic uh, that's kind of systemic to a lot of things we've been talking about uh, on the show. And, and really, it comes down to a core hindrance uh, in terms of why cloud computing is not more widely adopted uh, these days by enterprises. The ability to look at how uh, cloud costs are rising and uh, CIOs are seeing this as something that's going to be way out of their budgeted uh, allotment of resources. And so this is causing some consternation in the fact that people who are leading these enterprises who are trying to find value in their IT implementations are seeing their cloud costs rise. Probably some reasons that are their fault and some reasons that are the fault of the public cloud providers and some reasons that both can't be helped. But it's interesting to see that this continues to be a problem in 2024 and probably will continue to 2025. And it's something that's gonna be need to be managed. So this kind of came up again um, through a uh, recently published survey uh, from a company called CIVO, C-I-V-O. And uh, they raised some concerns around the cost of cloud computing again. And uh, this seems to be something you know, that's uh, very systemic. We hear about these reports about uh, every three or four months. And just as this really is just the latest one. And it's linked in the description below if you want to take a look at it yourself. So Civo, a company specializing in public cloud services, they published a report on the state of the cloud market. And they surveyed over 500 professionals in the cloud industry to analyze current trends. And their report focused specifically on Microsoft, Azure, Google Cloud Platforms, as well as AWS, which are the big three, AMG, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. And these are the three largest cloud providers. And they found that in this year's uh, uh, market, there were significant challenges. Their price is becoming more of a burden for enterprises than a cost-saving opportunity. So in other words, you have to kind of remember the history of cloud computing back in you know 2008 to 2012, cloud computing and its infancy was being promoted as something that's gonna provide a lots of value to the business because it's able to shift our, our um, CapEx cost to OpEx cost. In other words, instead of buying hardware and putting in a data center, we can use something as a service. And obviously that seemed like a good idea to us. I mean, obviously the analogy that they were putting forth at the time was you don't want to generate your own electricity, do you? <laughs> so you're going to use the electricity uh, from the power company and by economies of scale and the ability to share infrastructure with other people who are looking to leverage this resource, costs should go down and it should be easier to manage. And also the elasticity of cloud computing, we can turn things on and scale up to uh, the amount that we need, only pay for what we, what we need to use and turn things off and it scales down, much like resources, commodities, let's run utilities that come into our house. So that seemed very uh, compelling, I think, to a lot of enterprises out there. And a lot of enterprises made a, a quick steer toward cloud computing, some of them announcing cloud-only strategies and the fact they're gonna close their data centers and all these sorts of things that uh, were supposed to occur. And things didn't really go that way uh, after about 10 years into it. And so enterprises saw that the cloud prices and the cloud costs that they were seeing were way higher than what they initially expected. And if you looked at what was being proposed, you know, back in the early days of cloud computing, you could just do a back of the napkin calculation and figure out that they're going to be paying more. Um, based on the alternatives, in other words, leveraging your own resources, leveraging your own, own stuff in your data center. And so now we are in 2024, they're seeing this as a continued problem. And so in other words, their cloud costs are way higher than they thought they were going to be. They're shifting resources away from uh, other IT, uh, IT projects that need to be done, including generative AI development. Uh, into paying for their cloud resources, and they're a bit confused about this. In other words, what do they need to do to address them? And I think it's a, kind of a good idea that we take a look at here and see what their alternatives are and see if there's anything that can be done in the short term or how we can work this in the long term. So let's take a look at it. So it kind of threw a monkey wrench 
in the cloud computing value proposition was the fact that hardware costs, in other words, things you would buy and put in your data center serve, uh, servers and storage systems and things like that, drop significantly. And I wrote about this in my book, An Insider's Guide to Cloud Computing, where we were paying a lot for this stuff and paying a lot for data centers, you know, back when cloud first started. Now here we are in 2025. It really was a significant reduction in the price that we're going to pay for these on-premises resources. And so that kind of shot a hole in the value proposition of cloud. In other words, if we're using cloud computing to avoid using and running our own hardware and having to hire people to do it and get data center space, either renting the space, using colo provider or something like that, and then ultimately this is going to be something that is unexpected, or at least I think was unexpected in the industry. So suddenly we have the ability to create some of these on-premises systems at a much reduced cost than we can do things in the cloud. Now, obviously, there's other benefits and other reasons why we'd want to leverage cloud-based systems, agility, the ability to you know, scale up and scale down and renting resources may be attractive in those areas. And of course, if you're deploying something like generative AI, uh, cloud providers have you know thousands of services on these clouds that provide turnkey uh, systems for building serverless computing and container computing, things like that. So you don't have to create and maintain your own ecosystem in your data center. It's all there for you on demand. So we're still looking and trading these various you know kind of differences in the whole cloud versus on-premise resource. And what happened was. Uh, a few years ago, it was very well published cases in the fact that uh, uh, use of on-premise res premises resources for certain use cases, building you know monolithic systems, software systems, things like that, where the use of those systems were predictable. In other words, we know how much storage we're going to use, we know how much processing we're going to use, and we know how that that's going to mature and grow over the next five years where the value of cloud computing uh, kind of uh, became less of an issue. So in other words, we didn't have to change a lot in running this infrastructure. We're just using massive amounts of storage and massive amounts of processing. And if that's the case, then we're able to run that stuff on in our data center and pay much less for it. And so lots of publications were you know, around this, and I'll, I'll link a few in the description below as companies were leaving the cloud and seeing significant reduction in cost in doing so because they had things that were predictable and repeatable and they were doing a lot of the same stuff and running it in their own data center was a lot more cost effective for them for their particular use case. You have to remember it's the it depends factor here, just like it is with all of this stuff. In other words, it depends on what workload you're running. It depends on how you're building your systems. It depends on you know what kind of a system it is. It's AI-based system, serverless-based system, things like that. And then looking at the right platform that's going to be the fit, that's going to be the most cost-effective. And while on-premises solutions are going to be cost-effective many of the times, as we're finding, just because they've significantly been discounted in the last 10 years, cloud may be sometimes a better choice for some of those situations. And so... That's why there is no kind of one-size-fits-all strategy here. It's, it's tough for anybody to say, certainly for me to say, uh, don't move to the cloud or do move to the cloud or don't move to your, your on-prem systems or do move to your on-prem systems because it's going to be uh, situational in terms of what your application, what your data sets are doing and what the requirements are and what they need in terms of security and governance and application development and all those sorts of things. So it gets into very complex kind of decision making and looking at this stuff. But what we're seeing now is a lot of the drives that were made into cloud a few years ago and probably uh, you know 10 years ago in some, some of these instances, they're not seeing the value that's coming back from that because the prices of cloud computing hasn't necessarily been relaxed. If anything, they've increased while the price of uh, traditional hardware has uh, crashed. And so they're seeing the disparity and they're asking the right questions. This stuff is too expensive than we think it needs to be. So what do we need to do to mediate that cost? So what are the options here that we can do? What uh, you know, uh, alternates for using cloud are basically optimizing cloud in place? Well, there's lots of things you can look at in terms of options to reduce some of the cost of cloud computing. Number one, optimize in place. Uh, a lot of these applications and data sets that were moved into the cloud over the last 10 years, they were just lifted and shifted. In fact, there was way too much of that stuff going on. 
and they weren't optimized for the cloud environments. They aren't using cloud native features. They're not using the native uh, security systems, the native storage systems in the way they should be used. And so the inefficiency is something they have to pay for in additional cloud costs. It's very much like a, a power bill. Uh, if you have a very inefficient appliance that burns a lot more power, you're going to get a larger power bill at the end of the month. A applications that are under-optimized for the cloud are going to be no different. So one of the things to consider here is to look at the number of applications that you have in the cloud and consider optimization or modernization of those applications to get them to a better state. And that's going to be something that is going to be um, an option for lots of organizations out there. It just happens to be very expensive and very time consuming, in some cases very risky. So a lot of CIOs are not really happy with that particular option, and they're looking for other, uh, a bit more quicker fixes. And every time you hear something about cloud costs, someone you know uh, push, pushes up a multi-cloud strategy. Yeah, there may be some benefits in doing that. If we're able to mix and match um, better, more cost-effective cloud solutions and provide us with more cloud options, like the ability we talked about micro clouds, the ability to leverage smaller cloud providers that may be more cost-effective in some instances. But you should already have the capability of running a heterogeneous cloud infrastructure now. And, and if you're not there, you're going to find that you're running uh, more than one public cloud provider now anyway, which is really what a multi-cloud is. So becoming more efficient and more proficient and leveraging a multi-cloud is going to be a way to approach it. Um, and the ability to optimize, again, the utilization of these cloud resources, cloud services, and reduce dependency on a single provider. And in many cases, we're finding that uh, organizations or enterprises went with a single cloud provider, you know, such as AWS, Microsoft, or Google, and they were kind of stuck with the cost models and the pricing models of that particular provider. And if they push things up based on the way they're using the cloud, they saw their cloud costs go way up. And in a multi-cloud scenario, you will have some more options to move your workloads and move your data sets around uh, if those cloud providers are going to become more cost effective for you. So, and with a multi-cloud becomes the other cloud options that we, you have in front of you. The ability to leverage uh, micro clouds, um, the smaller cloud providers that may be more cost effective, the ability to leverage managed service providers, uh, the ability to look at uh, sovereign cloud providers, things that are in your particular country. And certainly this is popular in Europe. The people who are running something in Germany, they have very specific regulations and compliance issues where they're going to find it's more advantageous for them to run on a cloud provider that's going to be native to that particular country. All these things are on the table. Uh, none of them are going to be easy, by the way. It's not, and it's, it's costly to make the shift. So if you're suffering from cloud cost overload in, in a larger cloud provider, a couple of cloud providers that you're leveraging, switching to a micro cloud and switching back to on-prem and switching to a, a managed service provider, all that's on the table, but all that's going to be costly. That, that requires some cost and some risk in making those moves. So there's really kind of no easy pivot here. You have to consider the alternatives that you have, figure out which ones are going to be more cost effective and how to make the move into that particular alternative in doing so in such a way where you're going to optimize costs and get to a point where you're going to have a much more optimized IT infrastructure once you reach that once you reach that as is state, and that's the objective here. So, in looking at this from the uh, perspective of the public cloud providers that are out there, obviously there's you know three big ones, but you know really there's there's IBM and Oracle and Alibaba or Ali Cloud uh, that are out there as well. So. How do we look at this from their perspective, uh, since they're the ones who are setting the pricing? I think they would argue that they're setting the pricing they believe is fair based on the value they think they're delivering to the enterprise. Uh, and that may be true. And I think some of the problems that we have with some of the costs that we're seeing are higher costs in cloud-based systems is the fact that the enterprises aren't leveraging them effectively. And uh, so they did, like we just mentioned a few minutes ago, they did lift and shift in the cloud. There was no optimization. There was no utilization of cloud native capabilities. And so they're suffering from higher costs. And in some cases, the cloud providers are using the optimization word now, which means they're uh, looking to help them optimize their workloads on their particular system so their costs go down, which uh, you, know, you may think, well, that's a conflict of interest for them. Not really. I think they want to maintain you as a client or a customer, and they don't want you to move off to a micro cloud or off to, you know, back to your uh, 
your on-prem data center. And so they're going to work with you to uh, make sure you're happy in those systems. So they're not necessarily the villains here, um, but ultimately they're the ones they're paying money to. So they're the ones that the enterprises are kind of villainizing here. I think this is a shared responsibility thing, shared risk thing, shared shared uh, mistakes that occurred between the cloud providers and some of the enterprises that are out there. And so they need to work together to fix these and either come down on the price, come up with different pricing models, uh, provide toolkits to optimize systems that are currently on a public cloud provider. Lots of things can be done to um, kind of take this whole thing to a much more reasonable level. So this has real impact on the enterprises that are out there. So in other words, uh, if there's high cloud expenses, uh, there's not going to be as much money to spend on R&D and market expansion operations or the ability to have the cash you need to go off and become more innovative in the space that you're in. So if you're a tire company and you're looking for some R&D to build better tires, they're going to provide you more advantages in the market and you're paying these huge cloud bills and all the resources are going there. And since you have a fiscal responsibility to your shareholders to run these things and deliver an earnings per share dividend and all these sorts of things, that's going to mean there's less money on the table for you to do the things you need to do to increase the business. And we're talking about many millions of dollars here. This is not chump change. This is not a rounding error. And so that's going to be a strategic disadvantage uh, for the enterprises that are out there. And so the C-level leadership are you know, looking at the, the costs and they're asking questions right now. Uh, I get uh, consultations requests all the time in terms of you know, what are best practices in terms of, terms of uh, you know, cloud costs, uh, cloud cost management. Of course, we have FinOps, which is rising up in the ability to manage costs on an operational level and optimize uh, systems there. The thing is, there seems to be a chasm between our ability to do something, our ability to use FinOps tools and technology and our understanding of FinOps best practices and, and uh, uh, best practices that are out there and processes and the ability to implement them. So we seem to be very good at explaining it uh, to the enterprises. Um, the enterprises don't seem to be very good at investing and implementing these things. And I think that's because it's first, what are the first steps and what do you need to do and what kind of expertise you need to have around? Is this going to lead me to even more expensive processes and operations that I have now and trying to save money? And so those are legitimate questions. And so I think a lot of the enterprises now need to do some soul searching in where this technology is going, where their investments should be made, what their existing as is state is, what are the inefficiencies, and you have to be, become get to the reality that you made some mistakes and making some uh, bad architectural um, decisions that have gotten you into some cost trouble. Of course, it all runs, it's just very expensive. And then getting to a 2B state, which is gonna be optimized and much more cost efficient. And that's as simple as I can explain it. And so you need a lot of smart people in your organization, you need to get a lot of different opinions out there into figuring out how to close that gap. And I think that enterprises need to look at this right now. And certainly even before they move into the whole generative AI uh, issues, um, in many cases they can't afford the generative AI stuff that's out there, even though they're uh, being asked to invest in that space uh, until they get these cost optimization issues solved. So there seems to be a little uh, push and pull that's going on in the business right now. And uh, a lot of enterprises out there are struggling with the decision, the ability to look into how they're going to move into new technology and innovative uh, market differentiators to you know, kind of take their companies to the next level, um, but they can't afford it because their cloud costs are too high. So just to recap, um, the perception is, and probably correct perception, the cloud costs are too high based on what enterprises are paying. I think the mistakes were made on both sides, both on the enterprise and the cloud provider side. Cloud providers probably not informing and uh, not uh, providing the uh, optimized pricing models and the enterprises um, moving stuff without an understanding as to what they're going to be paying for. In every case that where people are complaining about the costs, um, they didn't see it coming. So in other words, they move massive amounts of systems and data into a cloud provider, and they didn't know they'd be getting these bills that are they're typically 2.5 times what they thought they were going to be paying when they first moved into the cloud. And, ob and obviously the inefficiencies there, they're not modernizing the applications, all the stuff which is on the enterprises. 
that they should have known, but also I think the cloud providers should have done a better job in informing and educating them as to what to expect and guiding them uh, a bit better in terms of how they're going to move into a public cloud provider and be successful. So there's no easy answers here. There's no uh, magical technology or magical tool or magical processes or, or you know, uh, amazing book you can read, even mine, um, that's going to tell you how to move your particular application and data stack into a much more cost-optimized situation. This is going to be something where you have to do a lot of detailed research into what you're running, what the inefficiencies are, and how to remove them. And it's really as simple as that. Well, that's all I have for you this week. You know, thank you very much for everybody who's uh, liking and subscribing. Please keep doing it. Uh, got up to, uh, I think, 107,000 subscribers at this point, blew past 100,000. And so the channel seems to be going well. The show seems to be going well. And I think it's a message that people are willing to receive right now, trying to figure out the truth behind this stuff and how to get beyond some of the hype and get beyond some of the speculation, get beyond to the marketing dollars that you can spend out there into what the value is, what the value really is for this technology and how to make it work. So don't forget to check out my InfoWorld blog. Don't forget to check out my uh, Gen AI architecture course. I don't go cloud careers, uh, 70 some odd LinkedIn learning courses out there. There's a couple of new every month they're showing up. Please, please check those out. I put a lot of work and time in and they certainly do that at LinkedIn as well. Um, also, don't forget to follow me on, uh, on X. Follow me on LinkedIn and my book, An Insider's Guide to Cloud Computing. So until next time, you guys stay safe. Cheers.